Good afternoon. Welcome to all of you and to those who are watching remotely via the NIH videocast. I'm Patty Brennan. I'm the new director of the National Library of Medicine, and I'm honored this afternoon here at NIH to introduce our speaker, with, which presentation is a part of our History of Medicine program. The Honorable Lewis W. Sullivan is a chair of the board and a of of the National Museum, excuse me, the chair of the board of the National Health Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. This museum's goal is to improve the health of Americans by enhancing health literacy and advancing healthy behaviors. He's also the chair of a Washington, D.C. based Sullivan Alliance to Transform the Health Professions, a national nonprofit with a community focused agenda to diversify and transform health professions education as well as health care delivery. Dr. Sullivan served as chair of the President's Commission on Historically Black Colleges and Universities from 2002 to 2009, and was co-chair of the President's Commission on HIV and AIDS from 2001 to 2006. With the exception of his tenure as secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services from 1989 till 1993, Dr. Sullivan was president of the Morehouse School of Medicine, founder and president of the Morehouse School of Medicine for two decades. On July 1st, 2002, he retired and was appointed President Emeritus. During his tenure as Secretary of HHS, Dr. Sullivan led many initiatives that touched many Americans and the health and the health behavior of those citizens. Those initiatives included the an increase of the NIH budget from $8 billion in 1989 to $13.1 billion in 1993 establishing an Office on Minority Health, which has become the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at NIH, and inaugurating the Women's Health Research Program at NIH. Dr. Sullivan also led the introduction of a new, improved FDA food label and the release of the Healthy People 2000 report. Equally important were his successful efforts to educate the public regarding the health dangers of tobacco use, pre prevent the introduction of uptown, uptown a non-filtered mentholated cigarette, and inaugurate a $100 million Minority Male Health and Injury Prevention Initiative. Also as HHS Secretary, Dr. Sullivan achieved major steps towards implementing greater gender and ethnic diversity in senior positions at HHS, including the appointment of the first female director of the National Institutes of Health, the first female and first Hispanic Surgeon General of the United States Public Health Service, the first African American Commissioner of the Social Security Administration, and the first African-American administrator of the Healthcare Financing Administration, now the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Dr. Sullivan joins us this afternoon to offer a personal perspective on race, opportunity, and the U.S. health system. His presentation is based on a recently published memoir, Breaking Grounds, My Life in Medicine. Please enjoy the talk, and afterwards, please join us for a meet and greet sponsored by the Foundation for Advanced Education in the Sciences at its bookstore located just across from the auditorium. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Sullivan back to NIH. Thank you. Well, uh, Dr. Brennan, thank you very much for that generous introduction. And let me begin by saying um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with all of you this <coughs> afternoon. And I was thinking when I came, was this when I started as secretary in 1989, I was very much aware of the fact that for most of the American people, I was an unknown. My first time in public service, and I thought it's important to do everything I could to uh, get to know uh, people around the country as well as those within the department. One of my first visits was out here to NIH, here to the clinical center, where I'm not sure if it was this auditorium, but I spoke at an auditorium right here in the, uh, in the clinical center. Now, I had um, come to NIH a number of times as a member of various advisory committees to the Division of Research Resources, to the National Heart uh, Lung Institute, uh, and to many others at, at the time, but uh, this time, uh, rather than coming and going without being noticed, of course, there was a lot of infrastructure around my visit with security and preparations and all of that. And so that was really, uh, for me, a very um, interesting time because for me, uh, as well as the American people had to adjust to get to know me, I had to adjust to get to know the position 
uh, et, et cetera. And I'll share some of those things uh, with you. Well, as, uh, as you know from uh, the introduction from Mrs. Brennan and those of you who've known me longer, I've always been interested in increasing diversity in the health professions for a number of reasons. But they really start with my personal experience. Because I was born in 1933 during the depths of the Depression. Born in Atlanta. My father was an insurance salesman for Atlanta Life Insurance Company. I was the second of two boys. And my father was going broke because nobody was buying life insurance during the Depression. People were trying to have money to pay the rent so they wouldn't be evicted or to put food on the table. And so my father for reasons I never learned, decided he would try uh, becoming uh, an undertaker. <coughs> Atlanta was well established. We ended up in southwest Georgia, the small town of Blakely. So he established the first black funeral home uh, in Blakely, Georgia, a town of about 10,000 uh, people. But southwest Georgia really was a rigidly segregated community. The schools for blacks there, of course, were segregated. They received books. When the white school received new books, we received the hand-down books from the white school. The white school had a band. There was no such band. There were no instruments at the black school. My mother was a school teacher. And my father was really a social activist. He started the chapter of the NAACP there in Blakely in 1937. He sued the county and the state uh, to have the white primary uh, rule unconstitutional. Blacks could not participate uh, in that. He started an annual Emancipation Day celebration January 1st of every year. We would have speakers such as John Wesley Dobbs from Atlanta, Thurgood Marshall one, one year for the, from the NAACP, to urge blacks to really work to... Uh, try and, and vote, and to really improve the condition for blacks uh, in, in southwest Georgia. Because of that, my father was persona non grata. My mother, being a school teacher, they lived there 20 years, from 1937 to 1957. And during that time, my mother never got a position as a school teacher in Early County. This was the white community's way of retaliating. She would have to travel to uh, other counties. She taught in Cuthbert, Randolph County, Donaldsonville, Colquitt County, and other places over 20 years. And interestingly, she also taught in Rosenwald schools. Now, at that time, I didn't know what a Rosenwald school meant. But for those of you who may not be familiar, my wife and I a year ago saw this movie, Rosenwald, and I urge those of you who have a chance to see it, see it, because Julius Rosenwald was the CEO of Sears Roebuck. And through his efforts, he and his foundation built more than 5,300 schools throughout the South, from Maryland all the way out to Texas, schools for blacks. And so these, these were Rosenwald schools. He also uh, had a requirement people in the community would have to actively participate in the development of the school, either financial contributions or contributions of labor uh, so that, in essence, when the school was built, it was owned by the community. So that was an inter interesting story. I learned the details of that recently, but my mother taught in those, uh, in those schools. Well, because of those conditions, fortunately for me and my uh, brother, a year and a half older, uh, our parents set us away to attend school, first to Savannah when I was in fifth grade, uh, and then the following year to Atlanta while my mother uh, was working towards her master's degree in education. By the end of that year in Atlanta, uh, while we attended schools, by the end of that year, my mother had arranged with a friend uh, for my brother uh, and me to live with her while we attended schools in Atlanta. <coughs> so we would commute home to Blakely during the summer and holidays, et cetera, but we attended schools in Atlanta because schools in Atlanta, while segregated, were still much better for blacks than the schools in the rural uh, communities. So I finished 
uh, Book of Washington High School in Atlanta, which interestingly enough was the first high school, public high school for blacks uh, in the state of Georgia when it opened in 1924. I graduated in 1950 from uh, Book of Washington High, the only high school for blacks at, at, that, at that time. Well, being uh, a mortician, my father also operated ambulance service in Blakely. Which, and what that meant was someone who had to go to a doctor but who really needed to be transported, he would provide that transportation. And he would frequently take them down to see Dr. Griffin in Bainbridge, Georgia. Dr. Griffin was also our family physician because he was the only black physician in that area. Because in those years, we had two white physicians in uh, Blakely, but there were white and colored waiting rooms. The, the black waiting room was in the back, around the side. So my parents, like many black parents, resisted that. So rather than suffer the indignity of going into uh, a separate waiting room and being addressed by first name, because it was never Miss or Mrs., it was always Walter or Liberta or what have you. So we went to Dr. Griffin, 41 miles away, unless there was an emergency uh, that uh, we needed to have a care more acutely. Dr. Griffin so impressed me that I decided by age five, I want to be a doctor. I wanted to be like Dr. Griffin. He was successful. First of all, I was already interested in nature. I loved trees and flowers and the seasons, um, uh, birds, etc. Et uh, and uh, I was interested in, in people. When I would help my father taking someone down to see Dr. Griffin, when you'd open the door of his brick clinic, one of the few brick structures in Bainbridge, Georgia, you'd get the smell of ether. He would be dressed in his scrubs. That was also impressive. So I wanted to be like Dr. Griffin. So when I told my parents I want to be a doctor, my mother immediately said, Lou, that's great. You'll be a great doctor. And my brother, older, was planning on uh, succeeding my father in running the funeral home uh, when he grew up. So there was never a doubt in my mind from age five that I was going to be a doctor. So my parents served as role models for me because they were very dedicated uh, to us getting an education. Dr. Griffin was my first professional role model. And when finishing high school in Atlanta, I went to Morehouse College. Now, I was supposed to go to Clark College because my mother had gone to Clark. And we were a Methodist family. And Clark had been affiliated uh, with the Methodist uh, Church in its early beginnings, as Morehouse had been affiliated with the Baptist Church. So when I told my parents uh, when I was a senior that I was going to go to Morehouse, my father said, Morehouse? Well, that's a Baptist school. <laughs> so I said, well, well I, we talked about this. I said, well, Dad, you know, I'm not going to church. I'm going to get an education. <laughs> <laughs> and so my mother intervened. She always knew just when and said, Walt, that's fine. Morehouse is a good school, so if he wants to go to Morehouse, that's fine. So I went to Morehouse. That was a life-changing experience for me also because at Morehouse, all of us came under the influence of Dr. Mays. Benjamin Elijah Mays is a tremendous story in itself. And I urge you to really, those of you who don't know him, read about him. Born in South Carolina, a small town called 96, because Highway 96 went through the town. There was no traffic light, uh, and you would be through it uh, in, in a very short time. And by the way, Dr. Pettigrew knows all of this, being himself a Morehouse uh, uh, alumnus. Dr. Mays spoke to the students once a week at our chapel uh, uh, activities. We wanted, to, all of us wanted to be like Dr. Mays because he was eloquent, very intelligent, very, very well educated, uh, highly sought after as a speaker around uh, the country, uh, and uh, he really urged students uh, to really strive for excellence. One of his sayings to us was this, each of you was born to do something special in life. Your job is to find out what that is, then work hard to achieve it. 
He also would say things such as this. He says, whatever you choose to do in life, you should do it so well that no man living, no man dead, no man yet to be could do it better. He says, if you commit yourself to that, that when they're looking for someone in your field, they will have to consider you. Now, you may not get the job, but it should not be because you're not prepared. What he was telling us, in a segregated society, there may be barriers uh, because of prejudice, but we should not have a barrier because of, of lack of preparation. He had a tremendous impact on us because our most famous graduate is Martin Luther King, Jr. He was influenced by, by Dr. May. So the success of this school, which I think has uh, been outsized in terms of its size, I attribute to the kind of environment uh, that Dr. Mays and others, the faculty around him, provided for us. Because I say that Morehouse graduates are no smarter than graduates of other schools, but I think we are more inspired and more challenged uh, uh, and more attracted to really working hard to try to achieve something in life. Because he also um, taught us the value of service, that you should really have a life that is meaningful to you and as well as meaningful uh, uh, to others. By the way, uh, Secretary Jay Johnson is a Morehouse uh, alumnus uh, as, as well. So, so that was my exposure in, in college. Uh, and so when I graduated from Morehouse in 1954, that was the year of Brown versus Board of Education, uh, ruling that segregated education uh, is unequal and therefore uh, unconstitutional. Well, I went off to Boston University because we had been urged at uh, Morehouse to certainly apply to Meharry and Howard, the two predominantly black medical schools, but apply all over. You, we were told, well, your, your training uh, really has prepared you to compete anywhere. And Dr. Mays, by the way, had gone to Bates College uh, back in 1906. Uh, he hitchhiked up to Bates. He was so poor, left Bates as valedictorian, went to the University of Chicago where he got his PhD in philosophy and religion and later in my student years was our president there. So he, that was the kind of inspiration that he gave us. There were 19 uh, pre-med students in my class of 59 total graduates in 1954. All of us went off to medical school and one went to, to dental, uh, dental school. When I went to Boston, to enroll at BU, this was another transforming experience for me because this was the first time I would be living and working in uh, a non-segregated environment. I was the only black student in my class of 76 students. I met my classmates, graduates of Amherst, Middlebury, Princeton, Columbia, Harvard, Yale, Brown, and of course, the typical um, exchange uh, during our freshman week was, hi, Lou, I'm uh, Barry Manuel. I graduated from Boston University. Uh, where did you graduate? I graduated from Morehouse. Oh, yes, Moorhead. I've heard a great school. I said, oh, no, 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 not Moorhead, Morehouse. Oh, Morehouse. Where's Morehouse? Well, so here I am in Boston. My parents had invested a lot in me, as, as had the others along the way, Dr. Mays the faculty at, at Morehouse. How was I going to do competing with, against these guys? Was I going to do all right, or was I going to embarrass myself, let my parents down, or Morehouse down? Well, fortunately for me, we had our first anatomy examination three weeks later, and I did well, and I relaxed, uh, and, and had a very good academic and social experience at, at uh, Boston University, because my other question was, how will I be accepted by my classmates and by the faculty? Will there be hostility? Or will I be ignored or treated indifferently? That was not the case because I had a warm uh, reception by my classmates. I became class president uh, uh, for two years during my four years at, um, at Boston University. So although I was one of only three black students in the entire school when I entered, none in the class ahead of me, one senior, one junior, uh, but in spite of that, I had a very good experience uh, there at, at Boston University. When it came time to um, uh, apply for postgraduate uh, training, uh, 
I applied to a number of places. Uh, among them, uh, I applied to Bellevue Hospital in New York, thinking, that, well, I might have a chance there. But I decided, well, I'm going to be in New York. I'll, I'll apply also to New York Hospital and Presbyterian. They've never had a black uh, there, so I won't get in, but at least I'll get the experience of the interview. New York Hospital, I was interviewed by Mar Marvin Schlesinger. Some of you might know him, gastroenterologist. At the end of the interview, Marv said, um, uh, what's your schedule? I said, well, I'm uh, interviewing a Presbyterian this afternoon. He said, well, if you could stay, I'd like to see if I can get you in to see our chairman of medicine, Dr. Lucky. That was a surprise. They had never had a black there. What's going on? So I said, well, maybe um, they'll do this so that they could say that they interviewed me. So I, about uh, 35, 40 minutes later, I was in, ushered in to see Dr. Lucky. At that time, I didn't know Dr. Lucky. I had not even bothered to get to know the place because I just knew that this was not going to happen. When they opened the door to Dr. Lucky's office, <coughs> he was a cardiologist. This is 19... Uh, 58. They opened the door. There was a haze of smoke. He was a <laughs> chain smoker. <laughs> Went in. Uh, here, uh, those of you who might have known Dr. Lucky, he was very hefty. No neck. Head sitting right on his shoulders. Uh, florid facies. And so when he spoke, he said, Ha, son, nice to I said, Oh, my goodness. A thick of southern accent. And I said, Oh, my goodness, this is all over. <laughs> Well, I had a good interview, about uh, 15 minutes. At the end of that interview, Dr. Lecter said, well, Lou, you know, with the matching program, we're not supposed to um, uh, 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 give any indication uh, about our selection, but I just hope you're interested in us. And I left there and said, oh, my goodness. Well, sure enough, I was accepted as the first black house officer at New York Hospital. Now, this was not that many years ago, 1958. Here again... I had a great experience uh, because um, about two weeks after I had started, uh, I was assigned to the busiest ward on the, you know, in the hospital. The ner head nurse came up to say, Dr. Lucky would like to see you in his office when you get a chance. I said, uh-oh, what is this all about? I've been having good business, what have I done, et cetera. Went in to see him. He said, well, how are you doing? I said, fine. Learning anything? Oh, yes, yes, learning. Anybody give me any problem? Oh, no, no. Yeah, so he said, Lou, you know, you know you're our first black intern. And I, I'm from Tennessee. I've been here in New York 12 years. Started as chief of the Cornell Service at Bellevue, and now for the last few years I've been chairman here. Now, people in New York think that all Southerners think alike. But I want you to know that I intend for you to have a good experience here. And if anybody gives you any trouble, don't stop with the head nurse or the chief resident. You come directly to me. Well, that was uh, interesting because then I saw my own prejudices. I had made a judgment of him when I met him with that southern accent. Well, I did have a great experience at, at New York Hospital. I was there for two years. I had one incident with a patient who didn't want me to examine him. That was a patient admitted by one of our large uh, emitters. That patient was put out of the hospital 10 minutes later. So Lucky was true, true to, to his word. So I left uh, there and had, had a great, great experience. By that time, I decided I wanted to be a hematologist. I'd gone to medical school thinking I was going to come back to Georgia like Dr. Griffin as a general <coughs> a, a physician. Well, I went back to Boston to have my training and pathology at Mass General and then hematology at the Thorndike Laboratory at Boston City Hospital, part of the Harvard Medical Unit. And there uh, were great uh, investigators, William Castle, Castle's Intrinsic Factor, Jim Yondel and Victor Herbert, other outstanding hematologists. Uh, and this was a great experience. And uh, I was able to do uh, quite a bit of research, including uh, a study that showed that alcohol in amounts consumed by heavy drinkers suppresses the production of blood cells. Uh, and I want to read for you a uh, uh, section in the book because uh, this research that I did was selected uh, for presentation at the American Society for Clinical Investigation 
at their meetings in Atlantic City. In those years, the research community gathered in Atlantic City with Haddon Hall uh, and along the boardwalk. And so, so to really have a paper accepted for presentation there was really quite, uh, quite an honor. And also, a lot of, a lot of uh, horse trading went on along the boardwalk where the chairman of medicine uh, who were looking for, for faculty would meet and, and talk. So, so I knew that this was a very significant uh, a, a, uh, opportunity. So this was a paper on suppression of hematopoiesis by alcohol. So we, we carried out this investigation that is giving patients on the metabolic ward the equivalent of a pint of 86 proof whiskey a day. <laughs> uh, and it would knock the reticulocyte count down to zero. After 10 days when we stopped, the reticulocytes would come back and really in robust fashion. Yeah. Well, this is what I say in the book. We carried out this investigation in accord with the ethical standards of the time, though it could hardly be done today. <laughs> it was an important study, and it gained widespread attention. Subsequently, other investigators demonstrated the same syndrome in platelets, blood cells that play a central role in coagulation. All blood cells, in fact, react similarly to alcohol. So what we showed, ourselves and those who did the subsequent work, was that alcohol is toxic to bone marrow. We knew that alcohol damaged the liver, but this was the first time it was shown that it affected the blood system. We published our study in the prestigious journal of clinical investigation, and I was invited to present the paper at the annual research meeting of the American Society for Clinical Investigation in Atlantic City. My presentation was given an optimal spot late in the morning on the second day of the meeting, which meant that the planners were giving it a high priority. That was extremely gratifying, a confirmation that we had done something of significance. This was a giant meeting with perhaps 4,000 leading researchers and clinicians gathering at the Atlantic City Convention Center. By the second day, everyone had arrived, and by the fourth spot uh, on the morning's program, the hall was standing room only. Up on the podium, I scanned the sea of faces in front of me. I had never been involved in anything remotely like this. I continued doing biomedical research for many years after my stint at the Thorndike, but that study and that presentation remained one of the high points. Well, after uh, my training at, at the Thorndike, I uh, got a faculty position uh, at Seton Hall Medical School, now the University of Medicine Dentistry, in New Jersey. That lasted two years because that school was being transferred from Seton Hall University to the state. And I talk about this in the book. That was not handled well. They didn't inform the faculty of what was going on. And so in 1966, they announced that the school was moving out of Jersey City. But they, we didn't, we, they didn't announce where. This was in the New York Times. I, as a member of the faculty, was learning this. Well, uh, we finally uh, were able to get a meeting with the, chairman of the, the new chairman of the Board of Trustees in March. We had to wait until then. And he came in and gave us a little pep talk going to make this the greatest medical school in the country. I'm pleased to be chairing this, et cetera. Any questions? Every hand in the room went up. Where are we moving? Well, we're working on that. We'll get back to you. Why are we moving? Because in the Jersey City Medical Center, we had ample room. That has a history itself. This was built in the mid-30s as a, as a political payoff to Boss Haig, who controlled uh, Hudson County and carrying Hudson County gave Roosevelt uh, the re-election in 1936. So Roosevelt, with WPA funds, built the Jersey City Medical Center. So it was really very, very spacious. Well, because they didn't have answers, they lost a lot of faculty. I held on because I'd just been there a little bit more than a year. My laboratory was now up and running. Uh, but finally, when they announced we're moving to Newark, to the Martland Medical Center, it was a good center, but it didn't have the space for the school. And the Newark riots, in part, came about as a result of the uh, condemnation of many people's houses to build the medical school uh, there. Well, I ended up back at Boston University on the faculty in 66 because I decided that I really uh, wanted to uh, get to a more stable environment. 
So I was there and became professor of medicine uh, by uh, 1973. And I thought I was really uh, quite fixed in terms of my career plans. I had uh, an NIH training grant, a research career development award, and two research grants, uh, hematology fellows. My wife, I'd gotten married in medical school. My wife was from Massachusetts. Three children all born at Boston Lying in, in Hospital. But Morehouse College contacted me about a medical school, wanting me to serve on an advisory committee, because in those years, you may remember, there was quite significant expansion of medical education underway that started in 1956, when Albert Einstein uh, opened this medical school, and Seton Hall in Jersey City opened with their first class. So uh, there were 47 new schools that developed between 1956 and 1981. That came about because of reports in the mid-50s that we as a nation would be facing a doctor shortage if we did not increase the production of physicians. Congress got very busy, series of bills, health manpower legislation referred to collectively, funding for, uh, dollars for construction of facilities, scholarships for students, the National Health Service Corps Scholarship Program, a number of other uh, programs, so that uh, by 1981, Mercer Medical School opened, which was the last of these 47 schools, because by that time, the report had come out that I'm sure many of you heard of, heard of or familiar with, the Geminac Report, the Grad Graduate Medical Education National Advisory Committee. Uh, Alvin Tarlock, who was then dean at the University of Illinois, was the author of this study, saying that we had expanded perhaps too much, and we would be facing a surplus of physicians. So that uh, cut, uh, that, on, on that basis, support for the development of new medical schools really uh, stopped. So the last n new school that opened in the 20th century in the U.S. was Mercer in 1981. When Morehouse came along, uh, I was happy to advise them as alumnus, but I found myself being recruited for, for the position. And of course, I started in 1975. The, Moore, the Morehouse School of Medicine really was a result of a number of factors, one of them being number of new schools available, funding available, but also the Civil Rights Movement, because the Civil Rights Movement opened the eyes of the country to just how severe the conditions were for blacks in the South. Bull Connor in Birmingham with his water hoses, um, et, et cetera, and the way they were treated, the killings of Emmett Till, and his colleagues in Mississippi. So the country responded to that uh, in a way that when I started at Morehouse, not only were the black physicians in Georgia supporting this medical school, which was the first uh, four-year uh, medical school organized in the U.S. for blacks in the 20th century, so the, the only one, Charles Drew in, in, in Los Angeles, operates uh, in association with UCLA un under their accreditation. So the black physicians were supportive in Georgia and the white physicians. And what that meant, they went with me when I had meetings with the governor or with the members of the state legislature to get state support, et cetera. So there was really an upwelling of, of support uh, for activities around the country. So the medical school really was the beneficiary of that mood of the country to really try and address the shortage of black and other minority of physicians. Well, we just celebrated the 40th anniversary of Morehouse School of Medicine, and I'm proud to tell you that um, among our graduates, we've had a Surgeon General, Dr. Regina Benjamin. Uh, we've had a President of Meharry, uh, Dr. Wayne Riley. Uh, we've had one of our graduates from South Africa who went back to South Africa and uh, organized the first nationwide blood banking system in South Africa, modeled after the Red Cross blood banking system. I uh, last saw him in 2010 when I was in South Africa. They were celebrating the first year of operation of that blood bank without a single case of uh, HIV or hepatitis C transmission, making the blood supply in that nation safe where they have significant incidence of HIV hep uh, or hepatitis C in infection. So we've had many um, of our graduates who've done uh, things, and I maintain that from my perspective, one of the most important measures of an institution is what do its graduates do? Do they change the world? Uh, there. So, so we're very pleased with what our graduates have done. Also, the school was um, 
cite it uh, in um, the Annals of Internal Medicine as number one in terms of so social mission, not only the number of minority students, but also the careers that they have followed and, look, and the communities in which they have located. Primary care, and also, uh, that is pediatrics, family medicine, <coughs> internal medicine, and also communities where they serve because, uh, as many of you know, it was shown by Dr. Miriam Komarami and her colleagues at the University of California at San Francisco in 1996 that black or Latino physicians were three to five times more likely to establish their practices in the barrio or the ghetto. And their practices were different. Their practices had a higher percentage of Medicaid patients or patients without uh, an insurance payment mechanism at all. And they served as uh, centers of economic activity in the communities as, as well. So, uh, so we have been committed at Morehouse to having, uh, increasing the diversity in the health professions. Well, here we are now in uh, 2016. We now have another wave, not as, not as robust, of new medical schools opening, some 22 or 23 schools since the year 2000. Uh, and we now have the Affordable Care Act that was enacted in 2010. That has um, uh, increased uh, the number of people with insurance by some 17 million. We still have some 30 million without health insurance. And so while the bill needs to be adjusted and has some flaws, uh, I certainly hope that uh, Congress does not uh, uh, repeal it. I think it would be a disaster if they do that, uh, uh, and, and I uh, hope, that, hope that they don't. The other thing that, um, as mentioned, I'm pleased uh, to say is that the office, uh, the National Institute for Minority Health and Health Disparities came about because one of the things that I was able to do when Dr. Ruth Kirstein was the acting director here at NIH, we formed the Office for, uh, office for Minority Health in the office of the director here at NIH in 1990, uh, recruiting John Ruffin to be its director. As you know, that became a uh, center uh, in 2001 with legislation passed by the Congress uh, at the end of the Clinton administration. And with the Affordable Care Act, tucked into that act was one amendment that elevated the Center for Research in Minority Health and Health Disparities uh, to an institute. Now, one of the reasons uh, it has health disparities is this. When uh, efforts were underway in the Congress to elevate this to a center, Senator Byrd from West Virginia said, well, you know, I certainly support minority health, but my constituents, we have a lot of poor in our uh, state who are white. So, health, so I'd like to see that health disparities is in the name. So that was agreed to. So that this institute is to address health disparities, not only among minorities, but also other parts of, of the population. And I'm pleased to see Dr. Elisio uh, here as a new director. Uh, not so new now. You've been here a year. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so that... Uh, is something that was started uh, during, during our time. The other thing that I'm pleased uh, about is this. Those of you who have been around a long time know that um, uh, uh, Tom Malone chaired the Secretary's Committee when Secretary Heckler was HHS Secretary. Uh, Secretary Heckler's Committee looking uh, at black and minority health, that report that came out in August of 1985, uh, really led to her to create the Office for Minority Health in the office of the secretary. That uh, ha has served very well. We have made significant progress over the years in uh, increasing the diversity of the health workforce, but that progress has been far less than, than what, it, what we had expected. In 1952, 2% of the nation's physicians were African American. They weren't even counting the Latinos at the time. Today, uh, when we look at minority uh, uh, physicians, we find that uh, they represent approximately 8% of the nation's physicians, whereas minorities, including Latinos, African Americans, and Native Americans, represent some 32% of the population. So we're tremendously <coughs> underrepresented. And one could argue, well, why, why does it matter? Well, one of the reasons is Dr. Komarami's st study. The other reason is the... Uh, study uh, that was issued by the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, equal treatment, showing the unconscious as well as unconscious bias that physicians and other health professionals have 
in the system. So uh, 4.5 or 4.6 percent of physicians being African American is better than it was in 1950 when it's 2 percent. But when African Americans represent 13 percent of the population and Latinos represent some 15 or 16 percent of the population, you see that they're not adequately represented. And uh, those of you here at NIH know that when the study uh, uh, was published in Science in August of 2011, showing that the experience of minority investigators applying for R01 grants here, the experience was different, the success rate. For whites, 29% for first-time applicants. For blacks with similar years of experience, with similar levels of education that Dr. Ginter and her colleagues uh, corrected, 16% success rate versus 29%. So as a result of that, the mentoring program that has been initiated uh, to really try and help address that. I hope that program not only continues, but I frankly hope that it is enhanced because while it's a beginning, in my view, it is not strong enough to really have the impact that, that is really needed. Uh, so uh, Dr. Collins and uh, Dr. Tabak and others uh, will, will continue to hear from me until hopefully we'll get that uh, up to, to where, where it should be. The uh, country now, I think, really is challenged because I've never seen an election as polarized as this. And while on the one hand, uh, I've experienced a lot of changes, and my wife and I were here for the March on Washington uh, uh, back um, uh, when, when it occurred, and we felt that we had made a number of advances, and we have, but the experience that we have now in this election shows me shows me that those advances are not secure. Uh, when we have uh, the kind of hateful rhetoric that one of our candidates has uh, used, really wanting to build a wall, uh, uh, accusing uh, Mexicans uh, of all kinds of uh, undesirable behavior, wanting to ban Muslims, uh, also uh, really uh, disrespectful comments for women, I don't want my president uh, to really be that kind of person. My president is someone I want to look up to because growing up, like so many other children, I wanted to be president of the United States because the president was a role model, someone who embodied the highest aspirations of our country because we have high aspirations in our country. We've just had trouble living up to them. We've been marching, working towards them, and I want to be a part of that. My activities have been a part of that. All of us want to. But uh, I really uh, am troubled by the tenor of, of, this, uh, of this election. So, and of course, I've also made a public statement as to whom I'm voting for, uh, uh, too, uh, for, for the election. Because while uh, Mrs. Clinton may not be a perfect candidate, she is infinitely uh, better than the alternative. Um, so, um, I know that you're here as scientists uh, and not as politicians, but you vote and you talk to other people who vote. So I hope that you will be, be responsible as well. So I've now retired uh, officially, but the only difference in my activities is I don't get paid for what I'm doing now. <laughs> so with that, let me stop and uh, I'll be happy to respond to any questions uh, you have, either about things I may have commented on or things that I haven't touched on that you would want uh, me to respond to. So, so why don't I stop and see if you have any questions or comments. Uh, yes, the question was, <clears throat> can I relate what uh, was like when I was approached about becoming Secretary of Health and Human Services? First of all, I would never intended or wanted to be Secretary of Health and Human Services. I had a board member who did, and I thought he would be a great secretary. He was a physician. He was a senior executive at a pharmaceutical company. He was active in Republican politics uh, in um, uh, Connecticut. Uh, and, by the way, I, uh, at the time, 
I was fortunate Barbara Bush was a member of our Board of Trustees because I, what I should have mentioned is the dedication of the first building we constructed for the Morehouse School of Medicine was in July of 1982. We then had Vice President George H.W. Bush speaking at the dedication. He then invited me to go with him to Africa in November of that year as part of a delegation uh, visiting eight countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and that's when I met Barbara, and I was successful in recruiting her to come on our board. So I got to know the Bushes very well. My wife and I were frequently coming to Washington for events there. So I was lobbying him for my, uh, my trustee. He had, my trustee had been a finalist in 85. When Margaret Heckler went to Ireland as ambassador, um, Otis Boyne was appointed secretary. So my trustee was one of three finalists. He was interviewed at the White House by Don Regan, the White House Chief of Staff. And though you may remember, Regan was a very strong, prominent Chief of Staff. That interview did not go well for my trustee. And he left the White House knowing, well, he was out. And sure enough, he didn't get it. So in 88, three years later, with Bush running and with the polls looking well, he talked to me and said, you know, I'm still interested. I said, well, gee, that's great. I'll really uh, support you. So I talked to um, uh, uh, then Vice President Bush. I uh, said, you know, if you win, I have a great person for you who would be secretaries. So I sent the CV. By the way, I also sent him a nice tie. There was a shop in New York. I found a nice, <laughs> found a nice red tie with blue uh, elephants uh, on it. So I said, wear this on election day. It'll bring you good luck. Sure enough, he wore it. I saw it uh, on, the, on television. So the next morning, I called to congratulate him and said, congratulations. I see you did what I told you. And see what happened? So I <laughs> said, so now let's talk about Monroe. He, said, no. he says, oh, yes, I remember you know, uh, talking about that. But, Lou, you know, what I need to do is if you're willing, in a couple of weeks and things will settle down up in Washington, if, you were willing, if you'd be willing to come up, I need to talk with you about that. So I said, okay. And I hung up and I said, what the hell was that? <laughs> he said, am I kidding myself? Sounds like he wants to talk with me. But maybe it's really how do we really position Monroe? I talk about this in the book, too, by the way. It, it's a long thing. Um, well, um, when indeed he said he wanted me to serve as secretary, I said, well, let me think about this. I'm honored. Uh, my goal was to get Morehouse School of Medicine further. I felt I hadn't really done everything I wanted to get done at, at Morehouse. I said, but, um, but, you know, if I... Were to do this, I said, now there are some things that are very important to me um, I'd like to talk with you about. He says, fine, what are they? I said, well, among things, we need more diversity in that department. We need more programs to increase uh, the health of minorities and minority um, uh, uh, physicians and nurses and others. He said, well, fine, Lou, I, I agree. I support you on that, et cetera. So, um, so I went back. I thought about this talk to various people. So I accepted. Because, of course, when I went back to, to Atlanta, people say, what? What do you mean? Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I met with the Speaker of the uh, Georgia General Assembly. His name was Tom Murphy. He was the most powerful person in Georgia, more powerful than the governor. He had been Speaker for 20 years. The governor come and go, but Tom Murphy really <laughs> stayed because he controlled the budget and everything. And he had been really very supportive of us at Morehouse. He was one of the people I wanted to talk to. He was a Democrat. I wanted to know how would he feel if I went into this Republican administration. <laughs> I describe this in the book. But Tom Murphy wore cowboy boots, cowboy hat, came from West Georgia. When I went to see him, he sat down, looked me in the eye, took out a wad of red man tobacco, cut a piece off and put it in his cheek. And I'm here waiting, you know. He said, well, if Mr. Bush want you to be his secretary. I don't think you have any choice. You don't turn down the president. Plus, so far as I'm concerned, there's not a dime's worth of difference between Bush and Dukakis anyway. So that was his way of blessing me. He didn't like Dukakis. I didn't, didn't know that. But, right, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I described this in the book. It's really interesting. I came up the night before. My meeting was something like 1030 had breakfast. I stayed at the Sheraton Carlton there on 16th Street. And I walked through Lafayette Park. And I crossed Pennsylvania Avenue. I heard somebody say, there he is. All of a sudden, the people were running towards me. There were the cameras. Well, I didn't know at that time. Well, of course, the, one of the ways of White House vets candidates, you put the name around, see if anything turns up. 
So the press knew I was there, including people from the Atlanta Journal Constitution. So um, they were asking me, well, you're meeting with the president-elect. Uh, is he offering you the position of secretary? I say, I'm just responding to his request. I don't know what he's going to talk. And I'm in the midst of this trying to find out how the hell do I get out of this uh, without losing my dignity, you know. And uh, at any rate, when I got in, I saw Bob Tita, who was uh, one of his aides. And I told him what had happened outside. They said, what? You mean you walked here? Nobody walks to the White House. Didn't you? Why didn't you get a limo? Yes, sir. So I feel like I'm from East Podunk, you know, I know nothing about the things of what. They said, don't worry, we'll get a car for you when you leave, et cetera. There's some other things they, they told me, uh, you'll see in the book, that I didn't follow, and um, I really suffered that because they told me, don't talk to the press. Well, I went back to Atlanta. <laughs> One of the reporters from the Journal Constitution, we'd always had more, I was wanting to get the press over there to see what was going on. We'd be over there, the press, come over here and more, I'll see what we're doing. Well, this fellow wanted the interview and told my uh, secretary to tell him I can't meet him. That well, he wants to do a profile, but he will not print it until you are confirmed as secretary. So I said, well, okay. I gave him an interview the next day, front page of the uh, Atlanta Constitution. Secretary uh, uh, nominee uh, believes uh, that women have a right to choose. That was a big story. Phone calls to me from Marlon Fitzwater, <laughs> other people saying, you know, look, we told you not to talk to the press, so here's this other thing. <laughs> now I'm really feeling, I mean, how stupid of me, you know, of course, because I had felt that his word was his bond. Well, that was my uh, introduction. Fortunately, President Bush did not drop me because he had every right to at that time because the uh, pro-life people really didn't know if they could trust him. So now here was his secretary making statements like this. I, I thought I was being smart because I was saying, well, the Supreme Court has decided that uh, this is the law of the land, and obviously as secretary, I'm sworn to uphold the law of the land. Sure, that makes logical sense, but if you are pro-life, that doesn't go well with you at, at all. So at any rate, I came up, they said, you come back up to Washington. We need to really get you oriented. So I came back to Washington. And so for a period of uh, about 10 days, we had what were called murder boards. I had three ring binders, everything that the department it was in. And of course, I learned about what the history, what the issues were, et, et cetera. So my orientation really was from someone, no government service, to really coming to a position like this. And when I was sworn in, finally, uh, my uh, assistant secretary for personnel who swore me in said, congratulations, you're now the most sued person on the face of the earth. <laughs> that was because m most of those suits were Social Security, people, disability uh, claims denied, uh, et cetera. But fortunately, I had a staff of 600 lawyers within the department. Now, I don't know how many are there now, but only the Department of Justice had more uh, attorneys than the Department of HHS, most of them dealing with, with that. Well, other questions? Yes. Dr. Sullivan, Rodriguez Murray with the Morehouse School of Medicine. I'd like for you to talk a little bit about uh, the role of advocacy has played in your career. Uh, you've spoken about going to meet with former Secretary Heckler. Um, could you talk a little bit about the report, about uh, how the conversation went that day, some of the results that we all take for granted as being commonplace now, because of advocacy that has happened along the way. Right. Well, thanks very much. Um, that, um, uh, that's a very good question because basically um, what uh, Lodericus is Morehouse, we have three Morehouse men here at least uh, with Lodericus Murray and with uh, Dr. Pettigrew. We formed um, in 1977 the Association of Minority Health Profession Schools, which had initially included the Harry, uh, Morehouse, Tuskegee Veterinary School, and Xavier College of Pharmacy, but has grown to have now all of the minority health profession schools in medicine, dentistry, and pharmacy, five colleges of, of pharmacy. We formed that really to work together to advocate for more funding for the programs uh, that we were uh, 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 dependent upon, and to create new programs. The RCMI program is one that came about because 
of the uh, Association of Minority Health Profession Schools. When uh, Bill Raub was the acting director here, I met with him as, as president of AMPS at the time. So he worked with us and we formed that program, so that still exists uh, uh, today. Uh, the actual elevation of the Office for Minority Health uh, Research here to CETA, uh, uh, AMPS really uh, worked uh, with the Congress in that, and then the elevation of that to, to an institute, and many other things, because what we found was that there are 12 institutions now in the association. We come from Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana, Texas, Virginia, etc. So we would mobilize our delegation. So we'd get our delegations together, along with other uh, supporters like members of the Congressional Black Caucus. We had sufficient leverage uh, to really get a lot, lot of things done. And uh, a lot of programs, we were successful, not only new programs, but also advocating for uh, appropriations, because you know, a program without appropriation is really just a program, and that, that's, that's it. So, so no, we, um, we worked, uh, and, and I'll say not only minority schools, but many majority schools have benefited from the advocacy that, that we had. And so I uh, really would say it's important to be an advocate. I saw this in our legislature in Georgia, working with the Congress, and even uh, in, in Atlanta with the Fulton County Board of Commissioners, because Grady Hospital is uh, operated under the auspices of the county uh, system there. So a lot of people in public office really don't have the information. And they want to do the right thing, but if they are not informed, uh, you know, they may not, because if they have someone advocating for some position and you have another position that you don't bring to them, then they are really a disadvantage uh, uh, here. But uh, I, I really initially wasn't quite sure how to do this, because you can see how uninitiated I was at the beginning. But I've, uh, that's no longer the case. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Alessio. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, would you tell us about your experience as secretary? During, you were secretary during the peak of the HIV epidemic. And what was that like? Oh, yes. Well, um, several things uh, during uh, my tenure as secretary. First of all, when I did meet with uh, President-elect Bush when he talked about me becoming secretary, he also said, uh, Lou, I'd like for you to do this, but I'm not sure if I'm doing you a favor because the secretary of HHS uh, that my staff tells me lasts an average of about 18 to 20 months because uh, there was really quite a revolving door at, at the time. But the HIV epidemic was really uh, underway at that time. We formed the first National Advisory Committee. It was co-chaired by um, um, uh, Dave Rogers, president of the Robert Johnson Foundation, and June Osborne, who at that time was dean of the University of Michigan School of, of Public Health. We tried, tried to put together an advisory committee, and one of the members we got was Magic Johnson. But Magic wasn't really quite sure about us, and he, he was there for the initial meeting there at the Oval Office at the White House. But he resigned after about six months because he just never trusted this, uh, this, this committee. But, but we worked a lot to address the AIDS uh, epidemic. President Bush put $4.6 billion into his budget proposal to the Congress for HIV treatment, diagnosis, education, et, et cetera, uh, because the Reagan administration had not been as positively inclined towards HIV and AIDS. So this was something that, and, and also we knew that because of that, a lot of people around the country really felt, well, this will just be a continuation of the Reagan years. So we wanted to make a clear statement. And something else that I did, I went out to the uh, International HIV AIDS Conference in San Francisco at Moscone Center. I tried to get President Bush to go with me, uh, but he couldn't because of his, his schedule. Uh, but I went out with a message because what we were trying to change the conversation. We wanted to say, we're committed to addressing this. We need your help. We want to work together. You know, we're not enemies. But the minds of the people at that convention were already made up. And one of the things that happened, when I was introduced, the bullhorn started, uh, the sirens, uh, et cetera, pennies being thrown up on the stage, eggs, et cetera. And so, um, so I, I kept my seat. Um, uh, uh, I kept my seat waiting until they would stop. Uh, and I, um, former chancellor there at UCSF, uh, 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 yeah. And so Julie Krevins, yes, because he was a hematologist. Julie introduced me. 
So I said, well, I'll wait and let them finish, because usually after four or five minutes it stopped. But it kept going. So after 10 minutes, now by this time, I'm really angry, because here I had come. I want to change the dynamic. I want to really work with them. But they're not letting me speak. So I got up and spoke, though I knew the people in the Moscone Center with that uh, semicircular roof, uh, concrete, noise was all over the place. But I knew the people on uh, radio and television could hear me, so I spoke. And uh, ordinarily, in, under those circumstances, I would have cut my remarks to maybe three minutes, but I gave the full ten minutes. And then I sort of waved uh, as if I was ending a triumphal speech, because I'm really now, I'm ticked off, because I'm <laughs> doing my best to really try and, 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 and reach out. Uh, <laughs> went out to the crown room at the airport, got a call from John Sununu. He said, you gave them hell. <laughs> I said, well, John, well, I was really c coming out here to try and uh, change the dynamic of the conversation. But, but no, we, um, we worked very hard. Uh, and of course, among the things, of course, it's, uh, it's no secret, among the things we tried to do at the time, we tried to recruit Tony Fauci to be director of NIH. But he turned us down. I even brought him down to meet with President Bush in the Oval Office. Tony's reason, he said, we have this new uh, virus. We're working on a vaccine. I want to stick with this because I'm convinced we work hard. Within four years, we're going to have a vaccine. He was that optimistic. Uh, yeah. so, so we didn't get, get uh, Tony to, to take the job. But that was another measure we had. We wanted to really change the dynamic uh, uh, here. So, so that was really a significant uh, experience uh, there. But again, I was pleased that we did bring the first woman uh, to head NIH, Dr. Bernadine Healy. We ended up with my chief of staff um, uh, meeting with her actually in a hotel in Las Vegas. I was out there for some meeting trying to match her schedule and mine. The only time we could find was that night. So here we were meeting in a hotel room in Las Vegas, uh, offering her the position of the director of NIH. She, she did accept. Uh, under, under those uh, other than optimal circumstances in, in the came. And of course, she developed the Women's Health Research Program that we supported, which I think is very good. So, so that's one of the things we're very pleased with. I have one yeah, question. Then. Yes. I'm uh, Dr. Margo Adesanya from NIDCR, yes. and I'm a graduate of that other school, Meharry Medical College. Oftentimes, we hear that when we talk about Howard and uh, Meharry, yes. the other school. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I think highly of Meharry. No, no. Very, uh, my classmate, Dr. Henry Foster, served as dean at Meharry for a time. So, so Meharry, I visited a number of times. Okay. Great. So my question to you, from your perspective, what do you think are the ongoing underlying reasons why we're still facing underrepresentation of minorities in not only the healthcare field, but in research in general? And from your perspective, what are some of the things that we can do about it? You know, those of us who have, you know, graduated in the health profession and gone on, we want to make a difference, but maybe might not really know how. Well, um, complex um, question, and you have to have a long view. Because when you're talking about developing manpower, you're really talking about something over years. Because we need to do a lot of things. We need to strengthen K through 12 education. So many youngsters in inner cities don't get the kind of uh, academic exposure and, and, and simulation that, that they should. They don't have role models, because you know, in my career, I was lucky. I had role models all along the way. I didn't think about it at the time, but really looking back, that really, really, really happened. Uh, also, um, I had an uh, essay in Health Affairs in August that's saying Grasping at the Moon. That essay was about student indebtedness. I think as a country, we're in a terrible shape in higher education in general, and certainly in the health professions. The fact that students are graduating owing $200,000 in debt, yeah, that, that shouldn't happen. But in that article, I point out that the average entering medical student in 2014 came from a family earning $130,000, whereas the average family income in America is about half that, $56,000. Uh, uh, when we look at black students, they're coming from families 
uh, earning $70,000, less than white students, but again, twice as high as average income for black families, around $35,000. So uh, I point out in that uh, essay, when I entered Boston University School of Medicine in 1954, I had scholarships. I graduated owing $500, which I paid off by the end of my internship year. So money was not an issue, but money is an issue now. We are not seeing students from low-income backgrounds coming into the health professions. Those who do come through end up with debt. That debt changes their decision-making because they have to worry about discharging that debt. So that drives them into high-paying specialties or into affluent communities. So on the one hand, all of us say, we need to have more primary care physicians. We need to have more physicians in underserved areas. But we have a system that drives them uh, away from that. So that I see as a failure of the country for higher education in general, including uh, the health professions. We need to change that. This wasn't that way until the mid-'70s. The mid-'70s, federal policies changed. A number of programs that were available were either eliminated or markedly cut back. The National Health Service Corps scholarship program was cut back, et cetera. We have to think of how we develop the personnel infrastructure for the country 10 years, 20 years down the road, rather than the idea that, well, these are going to be high earners, so why should the taxpayer uh, support their e education? This is unintended consequences that have happened because of, because of that, that policy. So I'm hoping that we change it. But, but Take a look at that essay. I talk about that in some detail. I'm hoping that we can start a national dialogue uh, on that because if we want Congress or state legislatures to do this, they're going to have to have support from the public uh, uh, here. But in the same way that our transportation infrastructure is crumbling, our higher education infrastructure is crumbling because we're not giving it the support uh, uh, that it needs. So we need to do a lot of things, more role models, uh, et cetera. We also need to strengthen our family structure. You know, one of the things that um, uh, you know, single-parent families don't have as much income. So when you have a lot of single-parent families, those parents have a great difficulty supporting their children going to higher education. So there are a lot of things that we have to do, but over a period of time. Yes? Right, right. In case you didn't hear in the back, the question is, what about the <coughs> epidemic of opioid addiction uh, and what my perspectives uh, on it? Well, I have to first say I'm not an expert here, so I really um, uh, can't speak authoritatively. But, again, I think this is in part due to the economic stresses we've had in our society. You know, what, what has contributed to the current climate is this. People who have skills and who have jobs, they've done extraordinarily well. Um, and uh, we see that in the health professions. But people who really, the, where the jobs have changed, such as in the auto industry, where we have a lot of automation now, a lot of outsourcing to other countries, those people have been left behind. The coal miners uh, in Pennsylvania and in, in West Virginia. So there's a lot of anger. So we had the... the um, uh, recession uh, starting in 2008. So those people have been hurt. Meanwhile, uh, the people who have done well have done extraordinarily well. So a lot of people, including myself, have been saying for a long time, this is unstable. You cannot have a society with such divergence uh, uh, here. Uh, so uh, so that, that's, that's part of it. Um, the, the frustration, the inability to improve uh, uh, one, oneself, but I'm not sure if that is all, because it really is uh, rather bothersome and, and surprising uh, uh, here that we've had this much uh, of a problem. Because all of us know what the consequences of using these drugs, uh, uh, what the consequences are. But um, it is really a major challenge, uh, and I wish I really had a better answer for you. 
Secretary Sullivan. Yes. Um, it's an honor to be here today to hear your story. Uh, my name is Andrew Sanderson, and as at least the fourth Morehouse man here, I felt oh. compelled <laughs> to ask a question. Um, the American Medical Association, as recently as a couple months ago, declared gun violence as a public health emergency. Could you talk a little bit about your perspective uh, in terms of what we can do to address it? Oh, yes. No, I agree with that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you heard that when I was secretary, we had a $100 million minority male initiative. That was one of the issues at that time. That is, what are the things that we can do to improve uh, the health and safety uh, of uh, minority males? But also, while we said minority males, we really were focused on minority communities here. But the things such as gun violence, drug use, unemployment, uh, et cetera, all of those things we were... Uh, interested in. And we were working with community leaders because we had meetings saying, what are some of the things that are going on in your community that if you had a grant uh, of some money that could really be helpful? So we supported a number of things, uh, job training uh, uh, programs, uh, financial planning, uh, career counseling, um, uh, really entrepreneur supporting entrepreneurship, et, et cetera. So, so um, the whole issue of um, gun violence has been around uh, really a number of years, but it, if anything, it seems to be worse now. At least it's more visible. And I think really having um, these cameras now everywhere has really made it mo more in the conscience of everyone where a lot of this is, was, was there all along. But now we see the examples of, of this, so it's, it's very, very bothersome. Places like Chicago... Yeah, that's very frustrating to say, well, that seems to be almost out of control uh, there. And the irony, of course, this is the home of the president. Uh, and Chicago is a great city uh, uh, that has many things, but why you have such a uh, problem there uh, uh, is, is a real, real... Obviously, these two things are mixed because sometimes you have drug dealers who are fighting for control of an area and so forth. So that, that's part of it, but that's not the whole story. Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Hi, my name is Patience Green. I'm actually a 2014 graduate of the Morehouse School of Medicine. Oh, um, right. So, <laughs> yay, I'm on a social, mi social, social mission. Um, just to piggyback off a few of the questions that you've received already, how does advocacy look today? Myself as a young physician and my colleagues, um, we're coming out of medical school. What can we do? Um, and how does that look and leverage our numbers in terms of making a difference and getting in touch with the politicians and just being advocates um, in today's society? I'm having trouble hearing you. The, could, the question, the question is, advocacy. how is advocacy different in 2016? Oh, than right. Than okay. I think it needs to be much more persistent, uh, much more sophisticated, because um, when I started uh, at Morehouse School of Medicine in 1975, I, I, I wasn't thinking about this at the time, but looking back, I had the benefit of the Civil Rights Movement. And I mentioned the fact that we had the white uh, physicians in Georgia, the president of the Georgia chapter of the AMA, really uh, working with me, not just passing resolution, but going with me to meet with members of the legislature saying, you need to fund this, this program, et, et, et cetera. This was an organization that when I was really in college, if I, you know, in the early 50s, black physicians in the South could not uh, belong. So, so there was a sea change uh, in the South, uh, also in the rest of the country, but very dramatic in the South. I went back to Atlanta. The mayor was black, Maynard Jackson, two years behind me at, at Morehouse. He was now the mayor. So the changes in the South were really remarkable, and not just, you know, platitudes, but real, a <coughs> real, real actions. And that's, frankly, still going on, on today. Um, uh, so, so, um, so advocacy back then... Uh, was not as um, urgent because the mood of the country had really changed because of the civil rights activities. Now, we are more polarized as a society. Uh, if we were starting over at Morehouse today, I think we'd have a higher hill to climb to really get things going uh, uh, here. And that, that's what bothers me. That's what I uh, meant when I said I think there's been some slippage. Uh, we are too polarized and I don't like this campaign because it's adding to the, to the polarization, whereas I think the goal that we've all had is to really have a society 
where these things that have uh, set us apart are no longer there. Uh, and you know, I think we have, you know, we've moved towards that, but I think we've, we've lost a little of that in, in the last few years, maybe starting with the recession, et cetera. And all these things are mixed in because when people really are uh, on the ropes economically, that's when the other bad instincts also uh, come out. So I think we need to be, uh, as, as an African-American, I have to be concerned about those poor whites in coal country you know, who are angry, you know, too, because they, their lives need to be better. Because if I believe in the American dream, that dream should belong to that person also. And if I expect him to accept me, I need to accept him. So, so we need to get, 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 get back to that. And see, that's what happened to me. I described my experience at New York Hospital when my previous experience had led me to be as, as reactionary. So, so that's, that's what, what I think we need to, to, to do. Yes. Hi, um, Malcolm Clyburn. I'm also a graduate of Morehouse College. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> Is anybody here from um, <laughs> <laughs> um, A couple weeks ago, I was at the Congressional Black Caucus, and there was a session on funding for community health centers and the decreasing funding and the decreasing workforce for community health centers, but specifically on the side of funding for community health centers. What do you think is the importance of community health centers in 2016 and the increase of funding for those health centers in 2016? No, again, I think my ears are telling me that I need to see an audiologist. So, so. <laughs> but, right. the, the, the concern is about the community health centers, uh -huh. how important are they today, oh, and how sure. do you address the concern that they're not being well sure. funded? Community health centers are more important than ever because... First of all, we are getting, we're trying to get medicine out into, excuse me, into the community. You know, we've had the deinstitutionalization of healthcare going on now for several decades, getting people out of hospitals, uh, free, uh, getting people out of the mental health uh, facilities, depending upon community health centers, and getting uh, the uninsured into the system where we have uh, looked to community health centers as well as private offices to do that. But we're also using community health centers uh, more than ever before as teaching sites for our health profession students. We want them to learn in ambulatory settings. We can't train them in the hospital and then expect them to go out and, and know what to do in establishing an office, et cetera. So no, I, I uh, fully uh, support the idea that we need to strengthen community to health centers. And one of um, uh, my thoughts has been this. We've had to focus, and the president and his staff uh, and members of Congress have had to focus so hard on getting the Affordable Care Act done. That's an insurance program, and that's great. We need that. But there's a hell of a lot more to do. So what I'm hoping is that we could really get beyond uh, this re repeal of the Affordable Care Act and really get to the, some of the other things. That includes addressing student uh, debt. But, but no, I, um, I think it would be a real mistake if we really... Uh, let our community health centers remain endangered because that's where people are getting care. I was on the Great Hospital Board until about a year ago. We was really increasing the number of community health centers and educating our clientele to use those uh, centers so that this would really decrease the pressure on the hospital. So, so clearly, I'm hoping that uh, we really can address that effectively. I'm going to have to call for the last question. Dr. Pettigrew. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, the country has you to thank for the very clear and standard and intelligible food labels that we now have that everybody takes for granted. Hmm. I would imagine that was a bit of a challenge to achieve that. Can you comment on that? Oh, yes, right. The, the question was, what about the food label that um, uh, was enacted during my administration? Um, and he asked if I would comment on it. This was a big challenge because, as you know, uh, the uh, regulation of safety of food is divided between this department, HHS, and the Department of Agriculture, with processed foods primarily at the FDA, uh, fresh foods and meats, etc., at um, <coughs> uh, the Department of Agriculture. The new food label that uh, uh, our colleagues at the FDA had developed was really designed to tell people how much fat and other salt and so forth, other and unsaturated fat was in foods. Ed Madigan was the Secretary of Agriculture. 
he was dead set against that because his constituents were uh, the cattle growers, uh, uh, the, the, the dairy farmers, etc. And so they were afraid that this new food label would really cause people to use less of their products. We were saying people, we were saying we're trying to promote healthy behavior. An important part of that is knowing your diet and choosing an appropriate diet. But if people don't know what's in the diet, then they can't, can't do that. Well, one of President Bush's uh, sayings, and this was our first day, uh, right after he gave his first, right after he gave his inaugural address, we had a meeting uh, in the um, cabinet room at the White House, and he read his principles. One of them was, we argue inside. We're together outside. So any things that you guys can't settle between yourselves, you bring to me and we'll find it. We couldn't settle this. So Ed Maddock and, and I met. The longest meeting I had in the Oval Office was over the food label. Because my usual meeting in the Oval Office was about 10 to 15 minutes. The president would see three or four people doing it. Well, we were there for about an hour and a half, I giving various arguments. I talk about this in the book, too, so I won't uh, go into the details now. But among the things, I had a paper placemat from a McDonald's. McDonald's had put on the placemat uh, a new food label. So Madigan had said, Mr. President, this will cost a lot of money. It won't do anything, cause more confusion, et cetera, et cetera. He couldn't say, well, my constituents, the cattlemen, think that they won't sell as much meat of people, but there's all these other things, be a waste of money, et cetera. So I then pulled out the food label. I said, well, gosh, uh, Mr. President, if Ed is right, well, why would McDonald's, who serves more food than any other uh, restaurant in the country, have something like this? Look, the President said, let me see that. He looked at it. Hmm, that's interesting. I knew I had it. Because <laughs> at that, he said, okay, you guys, I've heard both your arguments. Let me really digest this, and we're going to decide in a couple of days. Now, remember, we're all a team, and whatever is the decision, we're all together. That was telling said, I don't want whichever one of you loses. So I don't want you out there talking to the press. Well, two days later, John Sununu calls and says, President's going with your recommendation, so get ready. Uh, uh, with the announcement, so we said, fine. So I called out to FDA. Uh, uh, Dick Kessler was uh, our um, uh, 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 commissioner. He was away. So I talked with Carol Sheeman. She was our deputy commissioner for communications. And I said, Carol, the president's going with our recommendation. Now, remember, we're a team, and, uh, you know, no gloating, et cetera. I said, oh, yes, we're fine. So they, they interviewed her uh, the next day. The next day, the New York Times comes out, they ask a question, how do you feel about the new food label? Oh, we're very pleased, and we're trying very hard not to smile. <laughs> <laughs> that taught me, with bright people, they'll get a way to get their message out. This was her way of saying, we won. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope that you'll be able to join us and Dr. Sullivan in the bookstore for a book signing. And on behalf of Jeff Resnick and the History of Medicine Division of the National Library of Medicine, Please join me now in thanking Dr. Sullivan for a most insightful talk. Thank you.